one. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the TakeCast. I'm Davis Maddock, joined by Peter Overzet and Patrick Laird this week. And then also a very unexpected surprise. We knew we were going to do a book club for Radical Markets, a book that I've been wanting to talk about on the podcast for a while. And we and we tweeted it out. And one Mr. Glenn Well said, hey, you guys are, are doing this book club. I would love to talk about the book with you, Glenn. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us to talk about the book. Real honor to be on your show. Thanks. Hey, yeah, we uh, we really appreciate it. What uh, when did the book uh, initially come out, and you know maybe set the table for people of you know kind of some of the the overall maybe elevator pitch for it, and what the kind of reaction has been since it uh, was released. Well, so I'm an economist, and uh, I worked at the University of Chicago, and then at Microsoft, and a lot of my work was pretty academic, but when you know things in global politics really started getting kind of wacky uh, with populism and so forth in 2016, I was encouraged by a lot of people that I needed to put some of the ideas that I'd been thinking about together um, and try to turn them into some sort of coherent philosophy. And that was the genesis of the book. We started around 2016, came out in May of 2018. And um, one of the really interesting things that happened along the way was that one of the papers that led up to the book was read in the fall of 2017 by Vitalik Buterin. And I had no idea who Vitalik was at the time, um, but he tweeted out my paper, which was an academic paper. And I got more Twitter, Twitter traffic off of that than I'd gotten on my whole hi history on uh, Twitter before that. And so I got a little curious and I was like, wow, this is a guy who's made like millions of dollars and he's like a, 24 year old Russian Canadian sort of wacky guy. It sounds like a Bond villain or something like that. <laughs> and so I wrote to him and said, do you want to look at the book? And he said, sure. And I got back from him like 20 pages of some of the best comments I'd ever gotten on anything I'd written. And, you know, a lot of excitement about the ideas and uh, thus began sort of a partnership that's blossomed into a lot of what the book has ended up being, which is much more a phenomenon within the crypto space uh, and some other social spaces than I had any idea was likely to happen, so. Yeah, okay, so Pat, I, I have a question too before we kind of get into the meat of the book. When I, when I suggested this book in our text thread, had you heard of it at all or like like you're you're opening it up and you're you're reading the forward and you like what what did davis just suggest to me like what kind of you know vitalik is writing about the internet of money and bitcoin and ethereum did you think i was i was putting you on a wild goose chase with this book i mean when i looked it up i it looked interesting to me i i've read you know different um books related to economics mainly behavioral economics um so i'm sure glenn's familiar with like richard thaler at the University of Chicago, right? He, yeah, he was my colleague right down the hall, and I was actually next door to Steve Levitt for several years in my office. No way, yeah, so Freakonomics is like one of my favorite books as well. So uh, it's it, the, the book wasn't super far out from the types of things I've read in the past, um, but I thought just based on your, your Twitter feed and everything, talking about crypto and all these you know, new currencies, I thought it was gonna be something to do with that. Um, and I was actually, you know, just reading the book, Glenn, my, what I really liked was like the historical context that you introduced pretty much every chapter with kind of leading up to how you guys arrived at your ideas. Um, so I, Davis, I, th I thought it was, I didn't think it was too far out there, but I'm, uh, I still need to do my research on crypto. I'm, I'm, I'm not sold yet. Well, we'll have, uh, after, after Glenn leaves us, we'll have an hour for Pete and I to hard sell you on some of the things that we've been doing online with crypto. So we'll, we'll have plenty of time to, to get into that. Um, Glenn, I think a great place for us to start, though, would be kind of the, as Pete said, like the elevator pitch, but for the specific ideas. So the cost, the quadratic voting, uh, the visas programs, the institutional investing, and the data as labor, if you have, if you have uh, the the you know the the wherewithal to get through those, we and we yeah. can interrupt you too. Sure, let me let me. I think I can do a very short elevator pitch, hopefully on all. So, um, the first idea, which is cost, we now call it salsa, is that you know most people basically have a choice between renting or buying something. Renting, you have tons of insecurity. Buying, you own it, but it's very expensive. What if you could do somewhere something that's halfway in between? 
where you had the thing, you just got to decide basically your own rent, but that price that you set for your own rent determined what it would cost for someone to buy it from you. So that's basically the idea. It's like a middle point between these that makes, that gets the best, sort of the best of both worlds is the basic idea that you can have the fluidity and low cost of renting, but some of the security and, you know, um, opportunity to like benefit from your own investments that buying has. So that's the idea of salsa or cost. The second idea is quadratic voting. So the idea here is that you have a system that allows, rather than you just say, oh, I like that thing or I don't, to say this thing's really important to me, that thing's not so important to me. You know, you think about uh, politics. The real problem, I think, in politics, most people agree, is that it's very hard to find compromise and it all happens in back rooms in a very non-transparent way that the people aren't involved in. But what if you actually had a method for finding compromise through the voting process itself by having the people say, this is what's most important to me, this is less important to me, the way you'd make a deal, the way you do a negotiation. Imagine we could do that at scale with people around the world. That's the basic idea of quadratic voting. Um, the visa between individuals program uh, or VIP the idea is that, you know, right now a lot of people are against immigration um, to a large extent because the, the benefits go to companies. They get more workers, they get lower wages, you know, whatever. What if ordinary people could benefit from that? What if people or communities could sponsor migrants and get some share of the benefits that the migrants bring, uh, you know, basically charging taxes or whatever to fund the goods within those communities? Um, this is something actually that Canada uh, that has done with a lot of success and there's a lot more support for migration there. The um, institutional investors idea is that, um, you know, everyone worries about big companies, but actually the most powerful people uh, in today's world aren't really companies. They're the financial institutions that own the stock of all those companies and they own all the competing companies. They don't just own American, they own Delta and whatever. So they can use their power to actually coordinate them not to compete for uh uh for people's um sort of you know business and finally um the idea of data's labor is that all of the like really uh you know huge profits and impressive services that are available online are based on something called machine learning which uh trains algorithms not just based on some brilliant engineer or whatever but using your data so there's a great XKCD cartoon that I recommend. I don't know if you guys can like patch it in here, but it basically says, um, in order to tr uh, to access this website, please, um, you know, identify whether there's a red light in this, uh, you know, picture. Okay. Uh, please perform this in the next two seconds. Our our, our self-driving car is approaching the, um, you know, intersection. <laughs> And so the point is that, like, you know, all the stuff that's dressed up as, um, as you know, computers are doing these brilliant things are actually your data and you're not getting paid for it. And all this money is flowing to Silicon Valley and away from most of, you know, the heartland of America. Um, but it's all being done by, you know, people uh, uh, every day as they're, you know, browsing online. And I think, you know, one of the things about when you read the, like, you know, a lot of these ideas are paradigm shifting, you know, completely rethinking how we currently think about these issues. And it's, we don't even have enough time, obviously, to get into each individual one. But could you maybe talk about kind of the impetus for these ideas? Because it is based on both, you know, political stuff and democracy and how that works along with economies and all of that. What were the things that were frustrating you in the world that kind of led to you wanting to rethink things in this way? So I think the core of the book is like getting past a lot of the divisions that we usually have and turning them on their heads. The book mm -hmm. is kind of like super socialist and it's also super free market at the same time. Like all the ideas are about collectively managing things, collective bargaining, et cetera, uh, you know, common ownership, but using these like hyper market mechanisms, you know what I mean? They're sort of in a lot of ways kind of like very populist like it's actually pretty quick to explain most of the ideas and you can kind of just play with them play them with them in games but on the other hand they're like based on like really deep economic theory um they are sort of um you know in some ways like very grounded in like the idea of community and sort of 
in some ways conservative, they're progressive. So it's, it's the, the whole notion was to like, try to actually get past some of our divisions by having a really bold radical agenda, not like some weak compromise or whatever, something like really uh, out there, as you said, but that lots of different people could find something to to buy into. Yeah, I mean that is I kind of the kind of the the thing that gripped me the most about this book is that uh, obviously, like you know, the 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 libertarian hardos can look at some of the things proposed in this book and be like, that fits literally 100% perfectly with my worldview. But then also someone like me, who is, you know, a bleeding heart liberal and, and, and all of those things can also be like, well, yeah, this system, if it works, if it's implemented in a fair way, does, you know, it replaces a lot of the, um, the intended effects of central planning, but then also replaces all of the bad things that come with central planning, right? The, the bureaucracy, the, the, you know, the cronyism where, where things get doled out due to, um, political favor. Uh, Laird, why don't, why don't you go? We'll, we'll, we'll throw it over to you. Why don't you ask Glenn some of the questions that, uh, that you had written down from going through the book? Just real quick before that, though, I, it's kind of similar to what Peter was talking about. Like, how did you arrive at these five ideas coming together just for this book? Are, are these like ideas that you've researched personally? Like which ones are your original ones? And um, maybe you can talk about your co-author as well. Like how did you guys arrive at these five ideas? And then we can get into some more specific questions. So um, the quadratic voting thing, I more or less invented in 2009. The question, like exactly Sweet, right? what, 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 invented means a little bit complicated because there's almost right. always like some precedent for an idea and whatever but right. like but basically i invented it back in 2009 um the the cost or salsa i basically kind of invented with the co-author in 2015 though uh it turns out that that had been invented a bunch of times before me like in pretty much the same form i just didn't know it um and then um the VIP, I, we, we just like came up with because we had general ideas about migration and the issues involved. And we were trying to come up with like a proposal to do with it. The institutional investors stuff came out of research with Eric Posner, my co-author and this famous antitrust scholar, Fiona Scott Morton. And the data is labor stuff actually came out with a, out of a collaboration I have with this guy, Jaron Lanier, who's a fascinating person. Uh, you should look him up. He's like um, the inventor of virtual reality. And he's like sort of a white guy in his 50s with dreadlocks like down to his feet. And anyways, just a very cool person. And he's my colleague at Microsoft. Um, and a lot of these ideas came out of his book, Who Owns the Future? And why did they come together in this book? Basically, we were looking around this theme, this theme of like, how do we have something that's like ultra free market and ultra socialist at the same time? You know what I mean? That will make libertarians be like, that is awesome. And also make socialists be like, wow, that's maybe actually like a more efficient way of doing what I was trying to get at. And it's been a while now since the book has come out and we've talked a lot about there's so much now happening in crypto with decentralized finance. I'm curious, kind of, you know, are there any addendums or, or things that have changed for you since the book come out? Are there examples of some of these things being implemented on a smaller scale or things that make you more bullish about these ideas coming into reality, maybe sooner rather than later? I'm just curious of kind of what's changed since oh, you guys wrote it. All kinds of stuff. So basically based on all the activity that this generated, we created an organization called Radical Exchange which helps coordinate a global social movement around these things. We have a hundred local groups around the world that uh, work on doing stuff with this. Um, we are working with a couple dozen governments, jurisdictions around the world on all different scales of projects from the Colorado state legislature using quadratic voting to vote on uh, legislation to the Taiwanese government using a whole range of these ideas. Uh, in what turned out to be the most successful uh, uh, approach to dealing with COVID of any country in the world. Um, many leading games have incorporated these ideas. So uh, I don't know if you guys know Civ 6, but it's civilization. It's like the most popular strategy game of all time. And the latest version of it uses quadratic voting and it's diplomatic mechanism. 
There's art museums that are using these things in a variety of ways. I mean, there's just like all kinds of activity going on. And in the crypto space, there's like a zillion things. So the, the coolest one of them is that the way that Ethereum is now funding the open source software development that like underlies the protocol is um, using something called quadratic funding, which is a variation on quadratic voting that I came up with with Vitalik uh, and Zoe Hitzig, who's a poet and philosopher and economist. Um, in in like the year after the book came out. So, do you, how would you envision quadratic voting being institutionalized in the United States? Because in my mind, like representative democracy is like so fundamental to the United States. How would you do quadratic voting? Would it just be in the legislature, like in the the bodies making laws, or do you imagine like just regular citizens? As in the example in the book, it was kind of like, it seemed like a referendum, like a, a nationwide referendum was what quadratic voting would be used for. How do you envision it being implemented into the United States? Well, I think the first thing to say is that like, you know, if you ask that question of like, you know, Steve Jobs, when the iPhone first came out, almost everything he would have said would have been wrong. Right. You know what I mean? Because like the whole point of these things is if you have a cool general purpose technology, it'll end up being used for things you can never imagine. And I hope that that's true about quadratic voting. You know, the way that American democracy came about and the reason the American Revolution succeeded and the French Revolution kind of sucked was that the French revolutionaries tried to like take over everything and plan everything. And in America, everything sort of grew up through democratic experiments at the local level. And then, you know, you only had a revolution once that was already in place and they just wanted to get the king out of the way. So like, that's what I think uh, has to happen. Like quadratic voting has to be taken up by all sorts of communities to do all sorts of things. And, um, you know, it can't be like some design that someone like me makes, but I, you know, some ways that it's already being used in Colorado is by the Democrats who have the majority in the Colorado state legislature. They used it to do their budgeting, to choose which things were their priorities. Um, it's being used in, uh, I believe Finland for a, um, a uh, process where the citizens are like weighing in on some contentious uh, issues that the like legislature wanted the citizens feedback on, and they're using it to help people like you know reach consensus. It's being used in Taiwan to judge something called the presidential hackathon that's used to like basically give the government support to various uh, bottom up like civ tech uh, type initiatives that are used to provide services there. Um, and citizens participate in those. Um, and they're thinking about using it for doing referenda there. So like uh, getting things onto the ballot, getting signatures. Are you, so, um, are people from these groups that are kind of, you know, trial ballooning uh, QV, are they giving you feedback in ways that are, you're like, oh, maybe this is something I could tweak or we could improve this? How involved oh, for sure. are I mean, you in this? Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, that's the whole idea is that all this stuff feeds back in, right? And so... Um, one of, uh, you know, like my, the whole way I'm thinking about this has evolved a lot. In fact, I wrote a book called why I'm not a market radical. I mean, a blog post called why I'm not a market radical, but all the things that I now think are limited about what the book says and how <laughs> we can do better. Um, so like, for example, quadratic voting has this idea that like, um, it becomes more expensive, the more you spend on more tokens you spend on a given vote. Right. Um, which tend like means that um, you can show that you care more about something, but it also matters how many people. It's not just a matter of like, you know, putting uh, all your tokens on one thing. Um, but one thing I've come to realize is like, imagine that you know it's you and your partner voting on something. Um, you know, you probably have very similar interests, right? So it's not really like appropriate to completely treat you as two separate people. And then to treat everybody else as equally separate people, you actually want some way of being kind of like, well, you kind of, you and your partner go under one square root, but then you and like someone you've never met go under two different ones. And so we're like trying to think about ways of like incorporating the social dynamics into this so that it's not just an issue of like different people or democracy, but about different social groups and like how they're related to each other and, and so forth. So one of the one of the questions, I mean, there were many things about the book that I didn't understand, and I had to reread a couple times, obviously, because I was uh, I was an English major who just pretends to know about finance. Um, but one of the things, like the, I guess, probably the biggest question I had about the book is how 
is the QV votes earned? Like, do you just get X amount of QV votes for every day you're alive or every month you're alive or every year that you're a citizen? Or can you do things to earn more? Like, you know, something that's going on in decentralized finance right now is like proof of stake or like, um, you know, like uh, you provide liquidity. So like an example of that for quadratic voting would be like, you get more quadratic votes if you maybe you get quadratic votes for voting or or you improve your voting earning power by voting or by doing community service or by serving on you know the the pta or something like i i guess one of the things that seemed to be in my brain in a black box was how are the quadratic votes earned yeah, I don't think that there is any simple answer to that. I mean, different contexts will do it differently. So for example, in, in this game civilization, the way that it works is like, there's just a whole bunch of different things you can do to earn this currency that then is used in quadratic voting. And they have to do with the game, like, you know, what's your relationship with other empires and so forth, right? Um, in the radical exchange community, we're thinking about implementing a system where quadratic voting can kind of be passed from person to person as like kind of a reward for contributing to the community and and coming up with you know cool stuff and there's other contexts where you just want to say like you know each person gets a constant allotment because you want it to be like you know fair and you know impartial for citizens or something like that so like i i think it can be used in a variety of different ways again you know i think this is like a general purpose technology it's a right. um it's it's like uh it's like an iphone and you know there's lots of different things you can do with an iPhone, lots of different apps you can run on it, you know? Glenn, are, are you familiar with ranked choice voting? And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what are your thoughts on ranked choice, ranked choice voting versus uh, a QV system? Well, so ranked choice voting is um, definitely, in many ways, a much superior system to the voting we currently have. So I certainly wouldn't want anyone to say that I'm like, you know, against ranked choice voting. Um, that said, like, I think that if you put like a spectrum of like voting systems from like the current types of things we have to like, you know, QV here, I think ranked choice is maybe like 10% of the way. Like, I think it's an improvement, but it's like a very small improvement relative to the size of improvement that quadratic voting would give. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is? Because basically like ranked choice voting, if you just had two candidates, ranked choice voting is the same as the current voting system. Even with two candidates, quadratic voting is like way better because it gives you a way of saying what's most important to you. Um, quadratic voting, like ranked choice voting can still get into lots of weird paradoxes. Um, quadratic voting doesn't have any of those paradoxes. Um, so like, I just think like quadratic voting is like, a, you know, like ranked choice voting is kind of like going from like, you know, a blurry black and white TV to like a clearer black and white TV. Whereas like going to quadratic voting is like going to color or something like that, you know? Gotcha. It like introduces a whole new dimension to it. It doesn't just like make it a little bit better. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I if I understand ranked choice voting work, how ranked choice voting works in practice, it doesn't really eliminate the rot at the heart of like modern politics because like, for example, the thing that everyone says is, you know, the two party system doesn't work and we we get in this horrible political gridlock and no one can agree on anything and what ends up happening in these empires that exist for a long time is is no one really gets served other than the politicians themselves the way and and ranked choice voting i guess the way i understand it um maybe helps eliminate some of the more like super undesirable outcomes like kids in cages and things like that but at the at the very high level you're still kind of putting power the same way and then i guess the other thing about quadratic voting is it, it allows people to vote on more things because it kind of distributes the power more evenly like i think glenn i mean correct me if i'm wrong but that's kind of the idea is that with quadratic voting people are being asked to vote on things more often they're being asked to vote on initiatives and budgets and you know so on and so forth and they have to they have to allocate their qv dollars in a certain way yeah it, it could it could definitely do that i mean i guess one way of putting it is like if you want to think about like what it enables, um, no, like ranked choice voting is a better form of voting, but no one thinks you could like do direct democracy with mm -hmm. ranked choice voting and it wouldn't turn into a mess. Like everybody knows that 
direct democracy turns into a mess. Like, I actually think with quadratic voting, I'm not saying everything should be direct democracy, but like, I think there's a plausible case to be made that like quadratic voting could allow direct democracy to like actually kind of work a, a lot better. I mean, if not, not maybe not perfectly, but like way, way better than at present. And, and ranked choice voting just like wouldn't do that. You know what I mean? One thing I want to say too, I, you know, I, I've got to have a lot of people, you know, that listen to Davis's podcast in mind that are more, you know, fantasy football people or crypto speculators. One uh, thing that I think is the book does really well is each of these ideas, which we're now kind of getting in the weeds on and might seem a little complicated or hard to wrap your head on. They do a preface where they kind of do a utopian vision of how this idea could potentially play out. And that kind of sets the table for each idea and allows you then when they get in the weeds of how the economics of it would actually work, you really have that reference point uh, of how to ground it. And I found that as, again, someone similar to Davis, a lot of these ideas over my head, but just understanding the vision of it beforehand really helped me to wrestle with that. So I thought how you guys did that was really well, well done. We're trying to do even better than that. You know, we're, we, our CEO at Radical Exchange is actually an artist and we're all about games, movies, you know, really putting people into it. We want, you know, th these ideas are, I think, cutting edge technologies, but we want them to come up from the ground up the same way that, you know, the iPhone and, you know, the new TVs and VR, all this stuff became parts of communities that were early adopters. And that's what really made them work. We not, not, you know, being imposed from the top down, like some sort of government uh, policy. I know, I know we're sticking on um, quadratic voting a lot right now, but I, I just I have another question because I thought it was interesting in the book you mentioned as you're explaining it that in the primaries, the Republican primaries in 2016, in, in the book you said a quadratic voting was used, Trump would not have been elected the nominee for the Re Republican Party. Why do you think that is? And I guess before, I guess my skepticism in that is like, let's say these QV points or whatever they are, are given a certain amount every year. And then there's these disaffected voters that hadn't participated in years. And then all of a sudden this Trump guy comes around and they're all fired up. Like we've seen these rallies of, you know, fired up Trump supporters or we, and we saw them in, you know, 2016, like what if those people just had a ton of these QV points and they're, they're saying, we're going to put all of them. We haven't used these in 20 years. We're putting all of them behind this guy and you don't have enough people on the other side that vote against them and vote, vote them down. It's like, an interesting idea. I mean, I, I don't think anybody knows for sure, right? There's right. lots of things that could happen. Um, that said, you know, the overall feeling, and we don't know what would have happened, it would have all depended on what system you had and so forth, but is that Trump had a lot of very strong op opponents, and then he had a relatively small number of very strong supporters. And that on net, I think would have made him sort of net negative. And the point is under quadratic voting, like the way we set it up, like if you have a lot of strong supporters and a lot of strong opponents, those cancel out. Whereas our current system doesn't really do that, right? If you have a lot of strong supporters and you end up being one of the top two, and then it doesn't really matter if you have a lot of strong opponents because then it just comes down to like, who do you, who do you hate more, the like top candidate or the number two candidate? Whereas if like everybody hates the top two candidates, they're going to just like sink down because mm -hmm. you have an alternative other than voting for the next candidate, which is you vote negative on the one that you don't like. And then whoever is left, you know, standing becomes the leading candidate. Yeah, like someone who that no, like someone that no one feels strong about can win in QV basically because you you like let's say I have a hundred points and I say I'm I'm doing forty points against Trump, forty points against Biden. I have my twenty votes remaining, and uh, I cast those those twenty votes for uh, moderate politician X. And moderate politician X might only accumulate um, you know five million quadratic votes when all said and done, but. Uh, Biden and Trump could have gotten 80 million negative quadratic votes because people were were so against what they're doing. And, I, and that was kind of how I understood it. And I know that, we, again, as Pat said, we're really sticking on the quadratic voting. And I, and I want to move to cost here in a second. But I, I found personally, I thought cost and quadratic voting were the things that not only were most interesting, uh, but also like I can just see that happening because because the way in which those two th specific parts of apply to the way they're uh, the way they're applied work uh, the least well, like go the worst way in terms of how they were intended to work, you know, from Keynesian economics and stuff from from hundreds of yeah, years those ago. Are the most, they're the most fundamental ideas. Yeah. 
for sure. So the the you guys raised this, I think, in the epilogue of uh, the book. But basically, in quadratic voting, there is no rules against selling your votes, against being like, you can purchase my quadratic votes for 50 Ethereum or 4,000 US dollars well, or it, whatever. It depends. There could be different ways of doing it. You could you yeah. could prevent that if you want to have this more egalitarian thing, right? If you want to have, you know, it's 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 like one person, one vote. Or you could allow, you know, in other contexts, people to trade them as long as once the person has bought it, it's quadratic on them. So you can't pay someone else to use their vote separately. But buying those themselves, there's a possible version where that would be reasonable. So it's, yeah. And yeah, in fact, it's another example in civilization, they actually do allow, um, they do allow for the uh, trading of the votes for money. So. Uh, and, and it seems to work okay. Is that what you guys need to do for this is to design a board game that can encompass all of these ideas and make it this super fun, addicting game? Yeah, so, a yeah, there's a great example of that because Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering, which I don't know if you guys know, it's like the, probably one of the most popular games of the last half century. And he's creating a series of games based on radical exchange ideas. Um, and I've been awesome. like... Uh, prototyping them with him uh, on, uh, what's it called? Uh, tabletop Simulator. I don't know if you guys have ever played yeah, that. Cool. Yeah. You seem to yeah. have some good connections, Glenn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People just reach out to me. Love the book, man. People love they, I'm telling you guys, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't read the book, you're going to read it and you're going to be like, holy shit, this is a great book. And I, I wish that someone would have shown me these ideas five years ago. Like, it's a great book. Let's oh, thank you. Let, let, let me play the skeptic a little bit then. Yeah. And don't don't take this as me thinking that I have better ideas or know better. This is just me playing playing the skeptic. So we can move to the cost system, I guess, and, and quadratic voting can be included in this. So uh, reading this, I'll just a little background. Like I, I studied political science in college, and it was so fun to just see like these old. My wife's a political scientist. She uh, she's a professor at Harvard, actually. Awesome! Wow. Um, so yeah, it was just fun being reintroduced to like you know, the political economists and philosophers, John Stuart Mill, um, Rousseau, all, you know, all those people that are mentioned. Um, and the reason I found it so interesting in college was because like we take it for granted the way our government and democracy, democracy is set up. Like it's just a collective of people, like everyone in, not everyone, but most people in society just agree to live by these rules and allow these institutions to have power. Right, like as citizens, we've just given um, co coercive power and, and violence. We've let the, the government have a monopoly on coercive power, essentially, so that we could all be safe. So we, we kind of give away that right. And then we just all agree that this document written, you know, over 200 years ago, we're going to follow it to the, to the T. I mean, it obviously doesn't always happen like that. But we just agree as humans that this is what we're going to do. And most people in society go along with that. So that's why I find it so fascinating. And... Just statistically, over like the last 200 and some odd years, what democracy, along with capitalism, with all its flaws, has just created way more prosperity, I guess. You know, life expectancy has gone up. Um, literacy rates around the, around the world are, are higher than ever. So it's been on, you know, it's been, it's happened because of the systems that were put in place. Um so why introduce a new completely new system like cost and i think we should definitely try to explain cost um again just for the listeners how is that or how do we know that's not going to mess it up and we start you know going the other direction i guess is great know, great question and the one thing i would say before anything else is we shouldn't we shouldn't just impose a new system because it's got a really good chance of messing things up so that would be really dumb um, and that's why you have to start with experiments. That's why you start local. That's why you start with early adopters. Like, it's kind of like saying, oh, we now invented video calling. Like, you know, video calling sucks uh, or could suck or it sounds cool, but who knows? Uh, so like, why should we replace the entire telephone system with it? And the answer is no the entire telephone system with it. In fact, it took probably from the time, you know, video calling was actually invented in the 1880s. 
Um, and it was prototyped in the 1920s when it's commercialized in the 1950s. And it's only like now during the pandemic that people are actually really using it a lot. <laughs> so um, that was like 120 years, you know, 140 years, something like that. So I, I don't think it would be imposed that. I don't, I don't think anyone thought it would be a good idea to just like force everyone to get rid of their phones and replace them with video calling. But on the other hand, it would have been pretty dumb, like not for people not to try it out. I mean, it sort of makes sense. It's like a bet, sounds like a better system. It's just like has a lot more like sort of truth to what it's like to be with someone in person to it. And uh, people should try it out. And if it works well, hopefully it'll spread. And I think that's true of all of these ideas. Um, but, you know, I also think that it's kind of um, weird that in our society, we are like so focused on like, we've got to innovate new technologies, whatever. When new technologies, all of the exact same problem you just said, Patrick, like our society has worked for hundreds of years without social media. And now it looks like maybe social media is going to break our society. <laughs> so like, so like what, what the hell were we doing? Just like saying like, oh, okay, just like replace everything with social media, which is kind of what we've done. You know what I mean? So like, I'm a, I, you know, I have a real part of a conservative in me. You know, I, I agree that we shouldn't change too rapidly, but I think that goes for all technologies, not just for like, you know, the way we do government and the economy. Um, and in fact, I think that if we let like technologies just go wild and we let government and the economy like fall behind, that's how we end up like having no way to like control our lives and letting like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg run everything for us. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, well, let's, um, ahead, yeah, let's, let's transition over to cost because I would say of all the ideas, this was the one that blew my mind the most, but also seemed the furthest from actually being implemented. And so because no one would want to opt into this. This is, this is the thing. Cost only works if you're dropped into a video game simulation where everyone already agrees with it. Now I would say personally cost appealed the most to me because I find markets to be endlessly fascinating and determining fair prices for everything to be the most fascinating. But like, I'm just imagining trying to like pitch my dad on opting into a cost society <laughs> and him being like, nope, no way, not happening, won't do it. And also let us know, you you mentioned that it's now called Salsa. Let us know uh, what that's about. Yeah, so uh, the basic idea of this is, um, and, and this is the world where it, it sounds weirdest, but then I can give you examples where it's less weird. But um, like, you know, you would self-assess a price, let's say on your house, um, and you would pay a tax based on that self-assessed price, like, you know, your property tax, but then anyone could buy it from you at the price that you stated. That's the basic idea. Um, and- uh, also stand for? Self-assessed licenses sold at auction. Okay, I love just, it. Yeah, I, pra yeah. I practice while reading for uh, the for costs, and so now I got yeah. Someone told you to spice up these ideas, and so you yeah. named it salsa. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, keep going here with, uh, so, with this so, on costs. So, like, here's an example of how you could get there without it, you know, being so weird. Is that imagine you've got a new cooperative housing development? We're actually working on this with a development in Maine, um, and you just sold. Uh, rather than renting things or selling them, you just sold them under these terms. You said. You know, you can buy the right to enter into this contract. You know, some people would find that really weird. Some people like Davis would think it was awesome and would move there, <laughs> you know. And if the people who, who like moved there and it was awesome and things went really well and like, you know, the thing was booming and everyone like living there and whatever, then it would spread. So I think that's the best way for technologies to be adopted, not by like, you know, some government imposing them. Or, you know, another context where it would help a lot is people actually own bits of the spectrum. Like the, re you know, when you use your phone or when you're listening to the radio, it's all being going over the airwaves and people actually like have the right to broadcast and other people don't have the right to broadcast. And those are all owned by like companies. And, and right now, like all the TV stations are like caught up all the things that could be doing 5G and so forth. And that's one reason why we're like way behind China. So what if you instead had that rule? We're like, you know, yeah, if, if the old TV station wants to keep broadcasting, it can pay a lot for that. Or otherwise, it can let somebody else take it and, and turn it into Wi-Fi or 5G. 
And I thought that was one of the most compelling examples, both that one and the kind of hyperloop, you know, needing to buy land. There's one piece of land you need to compete, uh, complete this railroad or transportation system. That person could theoretically hold out, charge you $5 billion so you could complete your project. That made a ton of sense. I think it was on the kind of day-to-day living, the quality of life, the kind of uneasiness people might feel about having you know, their, their familiarity stripped out from underneath them. Is there any way, like, as I think through it, where you have like this hybrid thing where this kicks in after a certain amount of inactivity, this land isn't being utilized this radio. Now you're on the clock. Now you need to self-assess it. Whereas for the people who are using their stuff, I don't have to be worried about someone and and taping my uh, webcam because they like it more than me. I mean, so once again, I want to say like, go, you know, who knows exactly how all this stuff would work out and there's all different kinds of ways people could use it and people should play around with it. But, you know, the way I envision is I think most people early on in the system would just over assess the value of their stuff a lot and like nobody would ever take it and they would pay mm-hmm. a bunch of taxes. So is that so terrible? You know, you would have more taxes to support um, like quadratic funding, which we can talk about. We haven't even touched on the most radical idea in the book, the idea that I that I was most like, this is the best answer to everything, which is when people do these self-assess taxes and then they get paid, that doesn't go to like the army or anything it, or, or, you know, like all these, it goes to a public, fa- it goes to a public goods fund where like the, that specific money is like only things that benefit citizens, right? So like yeah, so that goes, you, schools, et cetera. And it can be allocated by quadratic funding. So like yep. rather than it being allocated by the government, it could be allocated actually by citizens. So I actually think that's one of the coolest parts of it because it it allows so, so the idea of quadratic funding is it's like quadratic voting but like it's a new way to like basically replace what governments do so rather than having government like have bureaucracy elected stuff instead of make donations like your show or whatever and then it's like crowdsource you know funding but imagine there was a matching fund for crowdfunding where everybody um like you know the more you can, contrib- there's matches to the contributions that people make, but the more different people that contribute, the bigger the matches and smaller contributions get matched more than bigger contributions. So that's like the quadratic thing. And imagine then the money from, from Salsa is going in to support that. So then basically what you have is you have a whole new, it's like a whole replacement for like the way that capitalism works and the way that government works. It's like you replace government with this crowdfunding and you replace capitalism with, you see what I mean? It's like a whole new way of imagining the economy and politics, and they're no longer two separate things. They become like a joined up system, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm with, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you for sure. I mean, and, and the, 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 I guess kind of the, the thing that you see that you just pointed out there is that these ideas um, stack upon each other, right? That like, the the ideas benefit upon one another and that they're they're the the true implementation of cost works better when we have quadratic voting and then uh you know the i don't know it's just it it's all it's all just very fascinating and um you know if there was if there was like a, if there was a community where i could opt into these ideas my my bags would be packed i just i'm i i am a true believer in this yeah, stuff well, sure. then, then join radical exchange radical exchange is all about having communities where people like build stuff where we can do these things together and you don't have to start big. Like this was this was what made America. I mean, look, what made America was not, you know, George Washington played a role, but it was really, you know, the pilgrims, they came and they like set up these communities and people just lived in a different way for a while. And they were far away from England and they didn't need to deal with the king and whatever. And they just tried doing things. And then they had a way of life and they didn't want the king getting in the way of it, you know? And that's how the American Revolution happened. So that's how good revolutions happen is when people just say, look, I, I I can find a space to live a different way. I think that's what's going on in the crypto community a lot, you know? While reading about costs or I should say salsa, uh, I, I was thinking like, I feel like it it, it is at, at risk of also being taken advantage of by like just people that have an understanding of like numbers and data and like machine learning, as you, you talk about later, like what, how do you stop the, the Tulsa system from being manipulated and people with more money and power 
you know, using it to exploit people in, in the system. Well, kind of I think the I think it's it does much better on that than our current system because our current system, I mean, look what happened with you know the GameStop stuff and all the things that go on in the financial markets. When you have these giant financial assets that if you get control of them and they have a high price, you just have a huge amount of wealth. Like crypto whales are similar too. That's like a very sticky system. You get a little bit ahead and the rich get richer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas it's the opposite under salsa because you have to pay taxes. If you get anything that's a value, you either have to put a high value on that and then you're paying a lot of taxes or you're putting a low value and someone can come and snipe you off. So it's just the system has this like self-correcting feature to it in a way that like, you know, standard capitalism doesn't. I just think there's like going to be some greedy people out there that figure out a way to take advantage of, you know, buying up property. Sure. And there will be in, in any system, right? Yeah, it's all you have now. Uh, I guess it's yeah. Not- yeah. The game theorists always win, Laird. They always win. <laughs> Patrick, did it make you think at all? Because there's some basis to it just very, very lightly on the concept of restricted free agency where your team has agreed to you know, pay you this price. But if any other team wants to pay you more, like they have to match that yeah. to be able to retain you. There's some kind of parallels there, not to the extreme of cost, but kind of a- There's actually something even more like it in horse racing. So in horse racing, there's something called the claiming stake where basically- um, if you uh, want to play in a race, um, you have to be willing to sell your horse for the price of the race. So the, so the point is like you could have like the best horses in the world running in some like crappy race, right? And that would like totally make it uncompetitive and it's dumb, you know what I mean? And so what they say is that if you want to run the horse in the race, you like can't be too confident you're going to win basically right uh because if you're willing to sell the horse for the price of the race that like keeps you honest right yeah it made me think again maybe just to i know this will sound this is like a very reductive example but again we got lots of people who play fantasy sports here davis and i play in these dynasty leagues where you you draft a rookie like patrick laird coming out we could keep him on our roster for the entire time but a lot of times there's in inactivity in these leagues because people don't want to make stuff happen if you were forced to assign a value to to every player on your roster yeah, so I'm start, starting to think of this game, a dynasty version where we could play with this, where it would create a really efficient market. This. I'm not yeah. sure, but I think someone has like a NFT crypto version of fantasy football. Oh, um, man. These rules. How but if you aren't, you guys should do it. You guys should make that a company. <laughs> yeah, you guys should definitely should do that. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I mean, what we're trying to say, incredible. Patrick, is you're just a little pawn on a chessboard, or I think Glenn compared you to a horse uh, before, too. <laughs> Myself, myself, yeah, yeah, Patrick, if you want to play at a football game, you better be ready to sell yourself, you know. <laughs> uh, Glenn, are you, a, are you a fantasy football player? I, you know, I don't do any sports stuff at all. Yeah. Zero. But actually, I lived uh, above a, a player for the Giants. I don't know if you know him, Nate Solder. Uh, yeah. He lived right near me in, in, in New Jersey. So, wow. yeah. That's Wait, great. Are you based out of New Jersey right now? No, I just we sold our place, which was just above Nate's. We actually almost sold it to them, um, and uh, we um, moved um, to a place that's like a little bit nicer under COVID. It's uh, on the water, so really good for doing outdoor stuff. There you go. And does so, your wife commute up? Sorry, does your wife commute up to Boston for? Uh, nah, there, you know, there's nothing. There's nothing going on in Boston right now uh, yeah. because it's disease. And so, um, yeah, she, uh, she just works from home and I work from home too. I know we don't, we only have you for a little bit more here, but we kind of talk. I don't have a hard stop. So if you need extra time, I can take it. Okay. I mean, we, we could take as much, we're, we're going to try and stop ourselves because I think we could take like six hours of your time with these questions. (laughs) Well, (laughs) maybe, maybe once, um, you know, this will come out, more people will be, you know, in our community will be excited to read it. Maybe we could do a follow up too once more. Uh, people have had yeah, a chance absolutely. to Absolutely. Look, I, the most important thing to me, as I said, is about getting stuff from the bottom up. And we need to reach all different types of people. So, you know, that even though I'm not into sports myself, like, I, I think it's just critical. We, we got to get all sorts of people playing with this stuff, seeing it. This can't be something that's owned by Silicon Valley or owned by me or a bunch of nerds or whatever. It's got to be 
part of everybody's, you know, reality. So I think the, the self-assessed value thing for some fantasy league, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. We got to make this happen. Yeah, um, yeah, like I, I want to keep, I want to keep Dak Prescott, but I, you know, if someone if someone ponies up the price, I gotta, I gotta. It's it's a it's an a, amazing idea. It, it yeah, would definitely cool. increase the interaction in in fantasy leagues. Um, so if someone hears this in the uh, in the fantasy community and wants to help us put us this in action, maybe Scott Fish, one of our our good fantasy community organizers, could help us with something like this. Um, but one thing too, so the world of crypto has changed a lot since your book came out. You even had, I think it was the epilogue, a little bit of your kind of skepticism about it, which was also a funny bookend with Vitalik, you know, doing the, the forward here, but how has, you know, this rapid acceleration in crypto development, specifically DeFi, has it made you think about these ideas in a different way? Are you still skeptical of some aspects of crypto? I'm just curious how that has dovetailed with all of these ideas. I'm still very skeptical of crypto. My skepticism of crypto is not affected <laughs> by the fact that it's, <laughs> and there's a lot of speculation going on in it. Look, the reason I'm skeptical of crypto is, uh, you know, really at the fundamental technical layer, I don't think it's innovating in the right way. Um, I think that the problem is that, um, look, think about the internet. The internet has this TCP IP idea, which is that every, there's all these, you know, computers and they're like, talking to each other across a network. Um, basically, even though it's allegedly decentralized, crypto is based on the notion of a single global public ledger. That's not decentralized in my view. You know, It's like, imagine that you had a big wall down in Washington, DC, and every time you wanted to like do anything, you had to go and write it on the wall in Washington, DC. That's not decentralized. That's actually centralized. What's really decentralized is when you have lots of different communities, lots of different people, lots of different sources of authority, rather than just this one big place where everything happens. Um, so I think that the right way to do decentralization is the way that the internet does it. Um, and that there's all kinds of reasons why that kind of didn't work out and got colonized by Google and Facebook. But I think we, we can fix those problems. And I have a bunch of ideas for doing that. I, I work at Microsoft and I have like a whole bunch of technical protocols that I think are better approaches than, than what blockchain has mostly done. But I think what's great about blockchain, it's got people thinking about this issue that data and power are related to each other and that you know we can restructure these systems and we're not stuck with them. So that's what's great about it. But I think the actual you know technical solutions they've come up with aren't, aren't quite the right ones. Yeah, um, so I guess my pushback to that would be is your your idea is maybe not wrong in the sense of like that's not decentralized in the way you understand decentralization, which is like the way that I think a lot of um, economists view decentralization and, and the way that I've heard uh, people who have, you know, way fucking more education than I do uh, think about decentralization. And I and by the way, it is true that Ethereum is not decentralized. There was once a hack on Ethereum and they rolled it back. They look they they rolled the blockchain back. They returned people their money. And that that can't happen on Bitcoin, right? You you don't have the votes, you don't have uh, enough people holding the coins to do that. And so I I am not as much of a uh uh, Bitcoin dystopia, every man for himself. Uh, you know, like that, that's not me. I'm not one of the libertarians out here um, eating steaks and, uh, you know, issuing vegetables because I love Bitcoin so much. But I, I do think at the, the protocol layer in the sense of not no one person can unilaterally decide anything for Bitcoin, I do think it does meet the definition of decentralization. And, and I, I guess also maybe the thing you're saying, Glenn, is that the actual protocols and the things that Ethereum can do are way more uh, vast and interesting than the things that Bitcoin can do, which is true. But I also think that as the internet, you know, as we move into Web 3.0, those things exist for, for different reasons. Like Bitcoin doesn't really exist in the internet of money. It's more of, a, of an investment, whereas Ethereum is more of something you actually can create and transact and change the world with. 
in the in the same way, Glenn, that you talk about how a lot of these ideas, even how you view them, have changed. How technologies like the iPhone, how it initially was envisioned, now how it's used is completely changed. Are there any ideas in crypto that you, get you excited? Little kernels that you could see unfolding into something that would actually oh, be all, all beneficial. Kinds of things. I mean, I think. Look, I think there's a lot of really interesting blockchain projects like Hollow Chain, uh, Ocean Protocol that use some of the infrastructure, but they don't have this idea that there's just going to be the one ledger for everything. And that they have the notion that you, you're going to build a bunch of different blockchains and all have relationships to each other. And, and, and you know, Ethereum is partly based on that idea. And that's great. And there's lots of experiments with different social systems like the ones we're talking about, bonding curve. There's, there's all sorts of stuff going on in that space that's interesting. I just think that the like basic primitive of the blockchain as an approach is is not as powerful as some of the more network based ideas. So for people who go read the book like us, what's that next step? You mentioned the, you know, the radical markets community. What's the way people radical can start exchange. Radical, radical exchange. exchange.org. Check it out. We'll, um, we got we'll all put it in the show notes. notes. The most exciting ones though are check out Audrey Tong. She's the digital minister of Taiwan. She's the most impressive person I've ever met. She's the only person I've ever met who I'd call a superhero. Um, she, uh, she, yeah, I, I can't say enough good about her. Hopefully there's gonna be a documentary or something like that about her soon. But she's someone who's actually made a lot of this stuff a reality in Taiwan. And because of it, Taiwan has um, like, basically nobody's died of COVID. The country, like all the problems we have with misinformation, all the stuff, Taiwan's like seen it off, even though they've got more coming at them because the Chinese are trying to hack the crap out of them. You know what I mean? And uh, so I think, you know, ta Taiwan and what she's doing there are the examples of how this can actually make people's lives better. Yeah, I just did a quick Googling. She looks like an incredibly impressive individual. So yeah, yeah. Davis and I will post uh, the links to some of these kind of additional resources in the show notes. And yeah, I think that's what's most exciting about this is it's not this book that you finish and you're like, okay, it's these these ideas percolate in your head and you start to see ways that you know they could be applied in all different areas, including fantasy football leagues. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited about that. You guys got to keep me up to date about what happens with all that. We will. Patrick, any any final words here for Glenn? I was just going to say, Glenn, I think you're the, the coolest expert I've ever talked to because you're you're unlike the people we see on TV where someone asks a question and they say their answer is the right answer. I love that a couple times today you just were like, you know what, honestly, I don't know how it will work, but people have these ideas and I'm not going to be the creator. So I think that that's a really cool way to go. And, about and the, the problem in our society, I think is we've got like the populace on one side and there's all sorts of agitation and whatever. And then you've got these like experts on the other side, but the reality is the experts don't really know what they're talking about. And, and the populace don't really have an alternative. So what you need is you need people who are actually just in good faith, putting stuff out there, letting other people make something of it, you know, treating people with respect and, and realizing that like, you know, nobody, nobody's God. And, and it's only by working together and like listening to what other, each other have to say that we're going to get anywhere, you know? I love that. I couldn't agree more, honestly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will, uh, I think we are going to cede the floor. We're going to let, we're going to let Glenn uh, get out of here. Everyone, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we are going to, have another show coming out with me, uh, Pete and Pat, uh, continuing book club, and then also talking to Pat a little bit about the off season. Everyone read radical markets. Uh, Glenn, where is the best place for people to purchase the book? I always ask authors when they come on, do you, do you care where the sentence come check, from? Check out Amazon. Make sure you get the paperback version though, because that's the one with the intro from Vitalik. You've got the hardcover. You go. That one doesn't have the intro from Vitalik, Patrick. So I know. I, I, I get more money if you do the paper if you do the hardback, but take do the paperback because the intro from Vitalik is great. There we wow. go. Yeah. Um if Vitalik, if you listen to the show because you respect Glenn so much, open <laughs> invitation for you to come on the program uh whenever you would like. And uh, everyone, we will be back with uh part two here pretty soon.